Well, I want to open this morning. Obviously, many of you know my wife is an elementary school teacher, so I have a soft spot in my heart for teachers, obviously. And uh, I heard a story about an elementary school teacher um, this week that I thought would segue nicely into this message. You know, um, there was a teacher who had uh, a a class that she was asking to do a project. And uh, she told the kids that, here's the project. I want you to go home and have your parents tell you a story. And this story needs to have a lesson or a moral at the end of it, something you can learn, that you've learned from it. And so the next day, kids come back, and the teacher's excited. She said, okay, so who wants to share the stories that you've learned this week? So this one little boy raises his hand. He said, yes, ma'am, my daddy is a chicken farmer, and um, (laughs) you're already laughing. The joke's not even done yet. My daddy's a chicken farmer, and one, we, we raise chickens, and we, we take the eggs, and we put them um, in the truck, and we take them into the market. We sell them. And so one day, we were on our way um, into town. We had this huge basket full of eggs, and we hit a bump in the road, and all the eggs fell out of the back of the truck, and they just smashed on the ground, and it was awful. And the teacher said, oh, no. Well, what, what's, the, what's the, the lesson? Well, daddy says, you know, you don't put all of your eggs in one basket, Right? Well, the next kid raised his hand, and the uh, teacher says, yeah. And he says, okay, so funny thing, my, my mom and dad, are, we're actually chicken farmers too, uh, but we raise these chickens uh, for poultry. And so um, one day we got this uh, batch of 12 eggs and this dozen eggs, and it came time for these eggs to hatch, right? And uh, only 10 did. And so the teacher's like, oh, no. And he says, she says, so what's, what's the moral of the story? And the teacher says, or the boy says to, to, to the teacher, you don't count your chickens before they hatch. You see where this is going, right? Okay, so then the last, last kid, this little girl, she stood up, and and teacher said, okay, yeah, yeah. So tell us, tell us what you learned this week. She said, well, I heard this story this week. My dad told me about our Aunt Karen. And he's like, Aunt Karen? Okay, so what what did you learn about Aunt Karen? Well, Aunt Karen was a flight engineer, and uh, she was in the war, and her plane was flying over enemy territory, and it was actually shot down, and Aunt Karen only had a parachute on her back, she had a machete in her hand, a machine gun, and a fifth of whiskey, and uh, it's amazing, isn't it, and uh, and so it, it, Aunt Karen jumps out of the plane. She's parachuting down, and, and it dawns on her. If, if, we hit the gr- if I hit the ground, there's a potential that the, the bottle of whiskey will break. So she chugs it midair, right, and parachutes safely into an enemy camp with 100 enemy soldiers. She lands on the ground. She mows down 70 of them with, uh, with the, the machine gun until all the bullets were gone. She took her machete, and she finished off 20 more. And then with her bare hands, she dealt with the rest. And obviously, this elementary school teacher is just shocked, and she's looking at the class, and she says, oh my gosh, what could be the moral of such a terrible story? And she said, well, Dad says you don't mess with Aunt Karen when she's been drinking, all right? So, (laughs) praise God you laughed. I did my best to really hype that up. Now, (laughs) I tell you that story this morning because as we come to the end of the book, of Ruth, I'm titling this message from tragedy to triumph because, friends, I believe that is the moral of the story. I believe that is what the story has always been about, that we see God take tragedy and bring triumph from it. You know, as we've been walking through this book over the past several weeks, we've seen plenty of tragedy, haven't we? We've seen famine, you've seen loss, you've seen rebellion, you've seen isolation, You've seen uncertainty, tons of tragedy. But if if we're all have if we all have eyes to see today, and what I I hope to just breathe some hope over this room today is, I want you to see that although we will go through tragedy, some of you are in that right now. Like you're either stepping into tragedy, you're coming out of tragedy, or one day you will step into tragedy, hardship, trial in your life. I want you to know that for those who know Christ. He will bring triumph out of it. That promise is for you. For all who know Jesus, I'm not telling you that the skies are going to part and everything is going to be great in your life right now, but whether it be on this side of heaven or eternity to come, God will bring triumph out of your tragedy. There's hope. So with that, let's stand together and let's read Ruth chapter 4 as we close out this, this book.
Ruth 4 says this. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of all those sitting here and of the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, well, the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetrate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in the former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting it in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself... He drew off his sandal, and then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have, bought, I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon and Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife, to perpetrate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the, that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth. And she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He said, uh, He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter in law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, if you were maybe new with us today, and, uh, or maybe you've been in and out over the last couple weeks uh, of this series, I thought it would be helpful so that we can understand the kind of arc narrative that's happening in this book and also see how it pieces nicely within a larger arc narrative that God has been writing uh, throughout time um, that I catch us up, you know, in the, in the story real quick. Do a little recap. If you remember, the story opens in a dark time in Israel's kind of complicated history and their past, right? Um, if you remember just the very first page of the book of Ruth, if you just flip it over and you see the very last line of the book of Judges, um, this uh, whole story is set in a dark time, a time when in the book of Judges it says that there's no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So everyone's rebelling against the Lord, they're doing what's right in their own eyes, it feels like home, doesn't it? And because of their rebellion, because they're doing what felt right in their own eyes, God has brought famine to the land. And remember, in the Old Testament, rebellion to God was often followed by Famine. Those things were closely related. And it's in the midst of this kind of backdrop that the, the Bible zooms in on one family, a family with a father named Elimelech and a wife named Naomi and two sons, Malon and Kilion. And this father is kind of faced with a decision to make. 
Do I, uh, we're in the middle of famine, my family's starving. Do I stay here and trust the Lord to provide for my family? Trust that the Lord will, will see us through this. Or do I kind of follow my gut in this and, and lead my family to a place where, uh, where there was just rampant idolatry, where children were sacrificed, and where sexual immorality was easier to find than a Kentucky basketball fan right now? <laughs> Shouldn't be after last I mean, I know that's, that's a little soon. But anyway. And, uh, and so what does he do? He, he goes with his gut, right? He moves his family to Moab, and soon after, they move into town. The father, Elimelech, dies, and then the boys marry Moabite women, which was forbidden, uh, and then they die. And so you, now you have three widows. You have Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws living in a pagan land with no food, no future, no protection, no provision, Pretty tough situation. Tragedy, if there was a picture of it. Then Naomi gets word that there's food again, that the, that the famine was lifted in Bethlehem, and so the family begins to move back to Bethlehem. And on the way, it dawns on Naomi, I'm taking two Moabite daughter-in-laws back to a town that will not love them, that will, uh, they will be outcast, and they will be basically refugees within. They will have no future. They will have no hope. And so she turns to the daughter-in-laws and says, go back to your home. Go back to opportunity. Go back to your gods. Well, Orpah considers it, and she says, okay. And she kisses Naomi and hits the road. Well, the text says that Ruth clings to Naomi. She makes a vow to go where she goes, to lay where she lays, to love the Lord, her God, as her own. She gives her commitment of faith to Yahweh, and then they move into Bethlehem. Now, as soon as they move in, they begin to unpack their bags, and, uh, and begin to, you know, Ruth begins to kind of survey the situation. Um, apparently, she realized there's no food in the cupboard. There's nothing in the fridge, and the bills are coming, so someone has to work. So what does Ruth do? Showing a hardworking, a committed, self-sacrificing woman, she hits the fields. She goes out, and she gleans in a field, picking up basically scraps from around the farmer's field. There was a provision in the Old Testament that the, those who would, um, who would harvest fields were to leave the outer area of it for those who were poor, who were, um, who, who were of need, that they could come and they could just gather it up for themselves. So it shows God's heart for the, the oppressed, shows God's heart for the poor in this. And so there you have Ruth, and it's, the text says, just so happens to be gleaning in a field of a man named Boaz. Boaz owns this field, and he comes to check on the field. He comes to check on the work happening, and he looks out over the field, and he just so happens to see this beautiful woman, hardworking woman, Ruth, out in the field. He's single. She's single. Things are beginning to look up, right? Well, he calls the young lady to himself. He says, hey, listen, um, uh, you can glean even among where my reapers glean and, and, my, and stay close to my female servants where they, when they go to drink, you go to drink with them. He invites her over for dinner. And it says, I love this, says that he fed her till she was satisfied. And she even had more to take home to Naomi. He loads her down like a pack mule full of more food than she and Naomi could ever, uh, could ever uh, consume themselves and she comes through the door, probably glowing a little bit and probably floating a little bit, right? She comes in and Naomi says, where have you been? And, and who is it that's blessed you like this? And she says, I've been gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. And then it dawns on Naomi, Boaz, that's one of our relatives. That's our redeemer. That's one who can change our, our situation, can provide for us a future, that's one who can turn our tragedy to triumph. And then last week we saw, Ryan did a fantastic job in chapter 3. We saw uh, this kind of cliffhanger in the story, right? If you remember, the mother-in-law devises a plan a little bit. We kind of played it, you know, joked with that a little bit. She was meddling, and we don't know if she necessarily was or she was just looking out for, for Ruth. But moral of the story is Ruth goes into the uh, threshing floor in the middle of the night. She waited until Boaz had had... Uh, his full of his ribeye and a couple glasses of wine. The text says his heart was merry. He laid down to sleep and she goes in kind of under the, the cover of darkness and she uncovers softly his feet and lays down beside him. Now he wakes up in the middle of the night and woo, there's a 
beautiful woman in my bed. What do I do? What does he do? What would you do? Well, he does the right thing, right? Showing a man of, he was a man of integrity. No one there to find out. No one watching. But he did the right thing the right way always. And I just want to, I don't want to blow by this this morning. I made a little asterisk because I just want to lean into this for a moment because that's what men of integrity do. Right? They never ask who's watching, who will find out. They do the right thing the right way always. Because a, a man who loves the Lord, who has godly character about himself, understands something crucial, that God is always watching and God always knows. Right? That's what integrity is. Who are you in reality behind closed doors when no one's watching, when you don't think anyone knows? Who are you in those moments? Well, Boaz is a godly man and and he, uh, he did the right thing the right way. She turns to him and she quickly makes Ruth, makes her intentions known. She says, I'm not looking for a one-night stand. I'm looking for a husband. I'm looking for one to redeem me and my mother-in-law, Naomi. And then Boaz says, well, I would love to. I would love to do that. He praises her for her intentionality, for her godly character. He says, I would love to do that, but here's the problem. It's kind of an epic letdown in the story. It's like, there's one little problem. There's one in front of me in line. I would, I, would, I would completely redeem you, but there's one standing in line in front of you. And so he says this. He says, listen, sleep here on the couch. I'm going to take care of it. At first light tomorrow, I'm going to find you a redeemer, whether it be myself or someone else. Somebody's going to Jared tomorrow, okay? You will have a ring on your finger by sundown. So sleep here tonight. And the next day, he again provides for her and sends her back to her mother-in-law. And then our text begins today like this. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. That next morning, Boaz didn't even wait or, you know, stop at Starbucks. He just went straight to the gate. He went straight to the gate to do exactly what he said he would do. Everyone in this time, you had to understand the way that cities were constructed. There, there were no, uh, all even the city corridors, the streets were very tight. Um, I was reading this week that most of those, uh, most of the streets, most of the byways in the city were really actually dark most of the time. It was not really a safe place to go. Um, and the only real wide spot, the only place where a lot of uh, kind of um, uh, commerce and business could thrive is at the city gate. It was the widest area of the gate in, in Bethlehem. And so what you see happen here is he goes to the gate. And you know what you think like this? The gate was kind of where like both the mall and the courthouse happened in the ancient world, right? It was where you did business and it was where you shopped. It was where you settled your parking tickets and it's where you brought, you, you know, you bought your daughter's prom dresses. It's like all happening in the same area, okay? Now, Boaz goes to the gate and something incredible happens. It says this in the passage, um, in, in chapter 4, as he goes, he says this, And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. And it just so happened, right? Just like it just so happened in chapter 2 that uh, she was gleaning in a field belonging to one man who could actually had the means uh, to redeem her. It just so happened that he comes to this gate and a redeemer walks by. I hope you're getting the point. There is no just so happens in the economy of God. God is er orchestrating. He is working. He is moving. He is is doing 10,000 things, bringing all things towards his perfect Will, and this is exactly what you see playing out here. Boaz comes to the gate. The redeemer next in line comes through, and he says, sir, won't you take a seat? Sit down next to me. And then he gathers 10 uh, elders from, from the, the city um, as witnesses in case the deal goes sideways. They would be there to kind of sort things out. So that they sat down uh, next to him as, as well. And I begin to think about the kind of man that Boaz, again, you're, you're just getting more of a picture, more of a profile of who this guy is. How much influence do you have to go to just go to a city, sit down, say, hey, sir, take a seat. Ten more, come grab a seat, right? We're going we're gonna to do some business here. But that's the kind of man you're talking about, a man with incredible influence, incredible character. And then Boaz told the, the Redeemer next in line how Naomi's husbands, how, how her husband and her son, sons had died while they were in Moab and how she had come back and that she was in need of someone. She had to sell off this parcel of land that belonged to Elimelech so that she could live, so she had, uh, she had means to survive 
He said, you're next in line, but you, you are the kinsman redeemer next in line. So if you want the property that, she's, that she needs to sell off, I need you to buy it. And if not, I'll do it. Now, you understand, this was a no-brainer, right? From just a, a business standpoint, this was a no-brainer, right? Um, Naomi is older. She's past the age of childbirthing and, and all that. And, uh, and, 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 and so all, if he goes and he buys the land, he can... He can um, he can work the land and, and gain profit from the land. It was going to be like a, a stream of income for him until Naomi kicked the bucket. And she was older and she probably would, right? And so from all like the ec- economics of the business plan, you're like, okay, yes, jump in. And you're sitting here, if you're reading the story, you're probably like, no, Boaz, what are you doing? Like you, you just, like, no, <laughs> like, he, this is not the plan. This is not what we've seen coming together in the story. He's going to redeem it. And then he actually says, yes, I'll, I'll do it. I'll buy the land. I'll redeem Naomi and Ruth. But Boaz is smarter than that. And what does Boaz do? He says, but there's a catch. <laughs> and in there always, like if the deal feels too sweet, too good to be true, what is it? It's too good to be true, Right? And this is what you find out in this text. He says, well, there's this one thing. I I mean, small print at the bottom, right? If you buy this land, it's a two for one. It comes with a Moabite wife, right? Ruth. And uh, and, and so, and here's the thing, right? Now, remember who we're talking about, the Moabites, right? Like the the hated people uh, that, that Israel was not supposed to intermingle with. You get a Moabite wife. And guess what, bud? The, 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 the time that she ends up having a child, if by you, you, you end up having a child with your new Moabite wife, uh, he gets everything. And the guy's like, okay, let, me, let me get this straight. So you're telling me if I buy the land, I got a mother-in-law and a Moabite wife, and if she has a baby, I got nothing? I'm out, right? He's like, no, I'm good. I'm out. And then uh, Boaz says, well, you heard it, boys. In the sight of all the elders, you heard it. I will redeem. I will redeem the land. I will purchase the land. And then we see something incredible happen. You know, you see this picture. I don't want to also blow by of Boaz. You see a stark contrast, don't you, of Boaz and this kinsman redeemer? The kinsman redeemer uh, wanted the land is one he was ready to move forward as long as it didn't impact his bottom line but you have here Boaz selflessly only concerned with the well-being of two ladies and then I also want to make sure you understand because the English doesn't help us out here okay in the original language when Boaz goes to the gate of this city and the redeemer comes by and he says hey friend take a seat that that original language in Hebrew of, of when he calls him friend is an idiom. It's a, it's a way of saying, um, it, I think the literal way you could say this is Mr. So-and-so. It's, it's like, the, it's like the, the Bible is casting this like kind of sarcastic negative tone over this, this man because of, of, of how he approached the, the deal. As long, he was only in as long as he was benefiting from it. And you have no record of who this guy's name ever is. He's just... Mr. So-and-so. Yet Boaz is preserved and his name is remembered forever. I just want to point, point this out to you today. This man is forgotten because of what he lived for and Boaz is remembered forever because of what he lived for. If you want to be remembered, be remembered for living your life for Christ. Be remembered for the kind of man of high integrity, of high character that you are. The kind of woman who loved Jesus and loved her family and served the church and gave her life for the mission of God in your days. That's what you want to be remembered for. Not for the, bu- the business you're building because well, guess what? It will be forgotten one day. Not because of the home you're, you know, you're, you're amassing. Not because of the wealth you're accruing. Not because of the investments and your brilliance. Be remembered for what you did for Jesus. That's what we see in Boaz's life. A man whose name is remembered forever because of what he lived for. And what he lived for truly mattered. It truly mattered. Then in verse 8, let's continue. The Redeemer looks at Boaz and says, it's all yours. Buy it for yourself. And Boaz says, I will. The, the, the kinsman redeemer next in line takes off his flip-flop, and uh, he says he gives it to Boaz. 
Now, this was a custom in that day. Listen, if me and you were doing a deal out in the hallway after church or something like that, um, you don't have to give me your crock. You can keep that, okay? Um, keep your Birkenstocks on. But this is, in this day was, was custom. Actually, in the time of the, this, this book was written, it was even out of custom because the Bible writer was saying, you know, of this story, it was custom in those days. So it had already passed even at that point. But here's what's significant about it. Um, it wasn't just lip service agreement to a deal. It wasn't just, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll buy the land. Um, I'll give you my word for it. There was, a, there was an agreement made verbally, but then there was a sign given so that everyone present, every witness would remember the day that this agreement, that this covenant, this contract, was binding. It was like this. When he gave me his sandal, he signed the papers, right? The visible, uh, the visible sign to this agreement forever. And then the story wraps up that uh, Boaz, he, he does. He, he redeems all the, he buys all the property belonging to Elimelech and Malon and Kilion. He, he redeems Ruth and they have a child and that child's name is Obed. And now this story closes. Remember, it opened with three funerals, right? Three funerals at the opening of this book. And it closes with a marriage and a birth. A beautiful story of tragedy moving to triumph. Tragedy to triumph. Naomi sitting there being praised that God has not overlooked her. That God has not cast her aside. That God has provided and nourished her for the end of her days. And she's sitting there with this child on her lap. Don't miss this. That one day would give birth to a, to a would one day father a son named Jesse. Who would one day father a son named King David. Who of which the line of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would come through. If there's an incredible story in the world, it's this, isn't it? Man, such an incredible story. So many things that we can learn from this. I could just walk through this thing and just point out things over and over and over and over that would be good and beneficial and, and edifying to our hearts. There's so many things in the book of Ruth that challenge us, that, um, so, so many models for us to try to aspire towards. But what's the moral of the story? The moral of this story, I believe, is simply this, that God brings redemption from our ruins and he brings triumph out of our out of our tragedy he brings redemption from our ruins and he brings triumph out of every tragedy i want you to see this if you think back on this story naomi and ruth were ruined right I mean, if there's ever a, a, a story of ruin, it's right here. Their husbands have died. Their futures are stripped away. Their entire lives have been upended. They were hopeless until a redeemer stepped in. They were hopeless. They were ruined until a redeemer stepped into the picture. But that is exactly what we see in Christ. You see, this story that we just read, that we just walked through for four weeks, it's not simply, it's not merely about uh, Ruth getting a husband and Naomi getting an heir for her, her family line to continue through. But it's about Israel getting the greatest king that there ever was and the world getting a redeemer, Christ Jesus the Lord. You see, just like Ruth and Naomi, you and I are ruined. This story abides and it's true and it's lasting and it's larger than simply the, the words on the pages we've read. Because you and I are a lot like Ruth and Naomi at the beginning of the story. Every one of us, the scripture tells us, are ruined. Every one of us have a massive problem. The scripture tells us in Romans 3.23 that you and I, every one of us, and this is what I love about the Bible, like that we could come to it with our religiosity, we could come to it with our resume, we could come to it with our morals, we could come to it with our hard work, and the scripture says, hey, guess what? All of you are equal before the cross. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is our default position. Not pretty good Christian people deserving heaven, but sinners deserving hell. That is the reality for every one of us. That is, our true, that is what is true about us. And the, and the problem with our sin is that it has to be dealt with. God is so holy that our separation before him, our, our sin causes this massive chasm between ourselves and God and there is nothing that we can do in it and with it and through it within ourselves it takes someone else stepping in it takes something without from with from outside of us to change our trajectory to give us a future a redeemer named Christ 
Jesus the Lord. That's exactly what he did. The story is not merely about a kinsman redeemer securing Ruth's hope and providing a future, but Christ securing and providing a future for all those who would look to him in faith, like Boaz. Listen, in this story, Jesus put his own interests aside. The scripture says he, he put on flesh and dwelt among us. He stepped out of glory, condescending to man, putting on human flesh, living a life that you and I could never live and going to a cross that he didn't deserve to go to, one that you and I deserved to go to. And he laid down his life there, purchasing our redemption in himself. Do you see Boaz in the story? Does Boaz point you to something greater? It should. Just like Boaz went to the city gate to make a legal transaction to buy back Naomi's, uh, to redeem Naomi and, and redeem the family line and to purchase all of her property, Christ was led outside the gate of Jerusalem where he made a legal transaction. The scripture says that our sin debt was laid on a cross and he paid every penny of it. And so that we would never forget so that we would never forget that Christ has made a way that our redemption could be brought out of our ruins and has by faith alone. He gave us a visible sign that we would never forget, not a flip-flop, not a sandal, but a cross. A cross that we could look to and say that I didn't deserve it, I didn't have it coming, I didn't work hard enough for this, but Christ and only Christ has secured this on my behalf. Not because, listen to me, not because you were good enough, not because you, you, you prayed enough, you came to enough Bible studies, you passed out enough flyers, you gave enough money, but because of grace and grace alone. And so today, I think maybe you're here today and you needed to hear that. I know I did this week. Some of us think, man, that you've done too much, you're too far gone, you, 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 man, you don't know my past. You know what the book of Ruth does? It just says, God knows your past. God sees your faults. God sees your failures. God sees your weakness. God sees your ruin. And because of his good pleasure to do so, he set his grace on a people to bring them from ruin to redemption so that he is the one that gets all praise. Amen. Secondly, I want you to see that God brings us from tragedy to triumph. Tragedy to triumph. I love how one writer pointed out this week as I was studying that Ruth is proof that God brings his people from life to death, from curse to blessing, from bitterness to happiness, from emptiness to fullness, from despair to hope, and, and I'll add from tragedy to triumph. Again, I said this earlier, but this story opened with three funerals and it ends with a birth and a marriage. It begins with Naomi experiencing the curse of being a widow with no heir, no hope, upended to the nth degree. And it ends with her being blessed with an heir on her lap that would be the grandfather of King David. It begins with Naomi saying that she was empty. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, a bitter old woman. And it ends with her being full and satisfied. It began with her having nothing, and it ends with her having everything. It begins with hopelessness, the story does. And it ends with what? By looking, not just looking back on a painful past, but looking forward to a hope of an eternal and incredible future. No matter what you've gone through today, church, no matter where you are, God is able to bring you from death to life, from curse to blessing, from bitterness to happiness, from emptiness to fullness, from despair to hope, and from tragedy to triumph. And maybe look at me. Some of you may today feel like you are bitter. Some of you may feel pretty empty. Some of you may feel like you're in despair. Some of you may feel hopeless today. Some of you may feel like you're up against a mountain that you can't climb, up against a wall that you can't scale. But I promise you this, look at me. If you know Jesus Christ, he did it for you. And he can bring triumph out of your tragedy. That's what the promise of Romans 8, 28 is. That God is working all things. All things. Death of a loved one. Cancer diagnoses, job loss, marital strife, kids off the rail, don't know what's, where they're at, what they're, where they're heading, uncertainty, infertility, tragedy, apart from Christ, but in Christ, in Christ, there's a hope and a future. 
And he is working all things together for his good, for our good, and his glory. I want to end with a story. The band's going to come. and I want to end with a story about a, a lady that I've read about. You've, you've probably heard of her. Her name's Joni Erickson Tata. You ever heard of her, Joni Erickson Tata? She was an incredible swimmer, incredible diver, an athlete with an incredible future ahead of her. And when she was 17 years old, in uh, July 30th of 1967, she was um, swimming in a lake and she got up on a, a platform, like kind of like a, a little island platform out in the middle of the lake. And she climbed up on it and she ran and jumped off of it, misjudged the depth of the water on the other side. And she dove in, snapping her fourth and fifth vertebra- vertebrae, making her, rendering her a quadriplegic. No, no movement of her limbs from her neck, shoulders down. Now, over time, the Lord has brought some mobility to that, but the point is that no, no more swimming, no more diving, no Olympic future. Her life was literally upended. If you know her story, it's an incredible testimony to the goodness of God and God's ability to bring triumph out of tragedy. She followed the Lord as a teenager and, um, but after her, her accident as a 17-year-old, you can understandably realize that she questioned, that she had an unbelievable despair, unbelievable doubt, probably a lot like Naomi in the story. What does the future look like for me? And I remember listening to her story and listening to her talk, and she said that she would lay in her room. She says, if I can't end my life physically because I can't use my arms and legs to do so. If I can't do that, I'm going to end it emotionally. She's told her mom to leave her in her room in the dark. And she just, just sat in her despair. But God wouldn't leave her there. And he pursued her. And she, she said that one day the Lord broke through to her and caused her to realize that her greatest healing wouldn't be her legs and her ability to walk again, but that God had cleansed her from her sin and her separation. That was the greatest healing that she was looking for, that she would ever need. You see, she would never be separated from God. And, and, and Joni says that one day she believes that she will walk and run with the Lord again in heaven. And she, she said this one night, she said, or she said this in this interview one time. She said, there are nights that I lie in my bed even now, what, 55 years since I, my, my diving accident. And I can say, and she does say as she lays there, oh, God, thank you. You were so wise. This is a quote. You were good. You were good at allowing me to break my neck because I don't know where I would be had you not rescued me. She says, I am I was my own worst enemy, and you rescued me. You were good for causing me to break my neck. Thank you. Keep doing it, Jesus. Unbelievable. How how do you? She has this other quote. She says, my weakness, that is my quadriplegia, is my greatest asset. Because it forces me into the arms of Christ every single morning to get up. She says, my legs don't work. My arms can't push me up. So every single morning I have to say, Lord, in my tragedy, would you remind me of the triumph of Christ? And she commits herself into the arms of Jesus every day. And listen, friends, if you're there today, some of you, that's where you're at. I know because I've heard... sat, I've prayed with you. And maybe you're here right now. I just want to, I just want to do this. If you're here today and you'd say, Hey, look, Matt, I feel like I'm in the middle of a hard space. I'm in tragedy right now. Maybe it's not to the degree of quadriplegia. Maybe it's not to the degree of a widowed, you know, of, of a husband passing or, but maybe you're here today. You said, Matt, I'm in a tough spot bigger than myself, beyond myself, if you would be so brave, so bold to say, hey, that's where I'm at today. I want to pray over you. I want us to pray over you. Would you just shoot your hand up in the room? Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else in that spot need prayer today? Questioning tomorrow, questioning the future, 
uncertain. Amen. Listen to me. If you know Jesus Christ, I promise you this. Your best days are ahead. Your best days are ahead. And God can, he can, and he will one day bring you triumph out of your tragedy. You know how I know this? Listen to me. The cross, the greatest tragedy that ever happened was the grounds of the greatest triumph we've ever known. And it could be true for you as well, and it will be. And maybe you're here today and you feel like you're in ruin, and it's because you are separated from Christ. You have no relationship with him. If today you're here and you say, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here and the Lord is tugging, he's calling, he's doing something in me. I want to know what it looks like to have that hope you're talking about. I want to help you with that. Grab me, I'll be in the hallway. Let us know. Grab that little blue card and say, hey, Matt, I want to know more about Jesus. I will follow up with you this week. We'd love to do that. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. God, I'm so thankful for this book. God, I'm so thankful for your word, Father. I'm so thankful that, God, you know our stories, Father. You don't just know them impersonally, sitting back, making informed decisions about their future. God, you are working in the midst of it. You're moving in the uncertainty. You're present in the hardship. You're there in the darkness. God, you are doing more than we could ever understand, Lord. So God, light. Joni in the story, Father. I pray for those who raise their hands right now, God, that you would give them the ability, force them into your arms. Because, God, they don't know what's going on. They they can't make sense of tomorrow. Maybe they're struggling with doubt. But, Lord, you're not flinching. And, God, if we would commit ourselves to you, if we would trust in you, Father, the the pain's going to be there. But, God, we can know certainty that our good Father is working all things together. And where you're taking us is better. Your plans are are always better. I'm going to close with 2 Corinthians. It says this, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison.